This is AP Calculus BC, and in this video, we're going to talk about section 9.9, .9, Convergence of a Taylor Series. So your book calls this Convergence of a Taylor Series, and really primarily what we're going to focus on is now that we've talked about how to know where a series is going to converge, now we can get into the idea of, okay, we know it converges within this interval. Let's use it. How many terms do we need to use to make this series converge to a certain accuracy? Okay, so to start with here, there are essentially six power series that we are primarily going to work with. And a lot of these we've already derived as we've been going through both the notes and also some of your homework problems. But these are series that you're going to need to know. So as much as I don't like to have you memorize things, this is one of the things that if you do memorize it, it saves you so much time that it's really worth your while. So we've got six series here, and we also have their um, intervals of convergence. So we've got the series for one over one minus x, the series for e to the x, sine x, cosine x, inverse tangent of x, and natural log of x. And just three of those, four of those right off the bat, I can see those are um, series that we went through in notes. Um, and then also the cosine and the inverse tangent are ones that I believe that you have done in the homework. Um, but we're gonna talk about how we can use these, and then next time we'll get into manipulating these power series so that we can start to model functions that are similar to the functions that we know the series for. So the good thing about this is, is if you ever forget, you do know how to derive these series. Um, however, you know we've seen that's a pretty long process. So if we can skip that process, that's really what we wanna do when we're dealing with series that are really common series that we see kind of over and over again. Okay, so um, to start with here, let's just kind of look at the idea of a radius and an interval of convergence again. So we have natural log of x here, and remember that series is x minus 1, minus 1 half x minus 1 squared, plus 1 third x minus 1 cubed, and so on. So it says use this power series to find natural log of 3. Well, let's look at it over here. Here's that series. Look at the interval of convergence. The interval of convergence goes from 0 to 2. So I just want to show you what happens here. If we try to use one of these series outside its interval of convergence, you would expect it to diverge, right? So if I go in here and try to use natural log of 3, that would be the same as 3 minus 1 minus 1 half of 3 minus 1 squared plus 1 third times 3 minus 1 cubed minus 1 fourth times 3 minus 1 to the fourth and so on, right? Well, you can see these terms are actually getting larger in magnitude. So what that means is, is that this actually diverges if I go outside my interval of convergence, right? So remember, the interval of convergence for this series was 0 to 2. So that's what will happen to us if we go outside our interval of convergence. We're no longer in um, the interval where our series is an accurate model for our function. So you might think, well, that's kind of useless if I have a series that only is going to model between 0 and 2. But what we can do is we can just shift the center point. And so, you know, we've got very easy ways. This is not typically something we do by hand. This is typically something that's an automated process. So if we've got um, you know, like a math software program that can actually perform derivatives, then you can easily program it to create a series wherever you need that series to be evaluated. And it can go through and take all of the derivatives and plug into the formula and simplify it all out for you. So what we're really trying to understand is, okay, once the series is written, then how do we use it? What's an appropriate use for this series? Okay, so let's say we are within our interval of convergence. Well, then the next thing we would be looking at is how many terms do I need to use to get the accuracy that I want? So one way we can do that, we talked about this a couple of classes ago, is the Lagrange error bound or the remainder estimation theorem. So we talked about the idea that this is essentially after however many terms you're going to use, we'll call it the nth term, we look at the size of the n plus 1 term. Um, the only difference is we have to look at the maximum value of the derivative at that um, x value as opposed to um, looking at, or excuse me, at the um, on the interval as opposed to just looking at the derivative at the center point. Okay, so let's look at how we would do this. 
So this says use the McLaurin polynomial for sine x to approximate sine of pi over 5 to 5 decimal place accuracy. Okay, so remember here, they're just talking about the McLaurin pol polynomial for sine x. They're just assuming that you know it. So yes, you could go derive it if you really wanted to, but the intent here is not to derive the polynomial for sine x. The intent is that you know what that polynomial is. Okay, so let's plug into um, the formula for that. So first of all, for sine x, let's just write what that would be. Okay, for sine x, we've got this polynomial where we know it's the sum. And remember, we're going to start at n is equal to 0 and go to infinity. Oops, go to infinity. And we've got negative 1 to the n. And we've got x to the 2n plus 1. over 2n plus 1 factorial. Okay, so that's the series that we're going to use. Now, what we want to do is we want to find out the remainder after n terms. If we want five decimal place accuracy, remember, we're looking at the n plus 1 term. So, first of all, for my maximum value, when it's a sine or a cosine function, I can just assume the maximum is 1. That's the largest that we're ever going to have. So, I'm going to plug in 1 for m, and then the distance that I am from my center point would be pi over 5 minus 0. That's going to be raised to the n plus 1 power. And that's all over n plus 1. Now, remember, when I go back and I look at my remainder here, this is using my general Taylor series um, formula, right? So I'm using the next term in the Taylor series formula. I'm not currently referring to that 2n plus 1. So that's the tricky part on this. So the next term in the Taylor series would be to the n plus 1 power. And I need this to be less than, and we need 5 decimal place accuracy, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. And now we'll just do that on the calculator. And when we do that on the calculator, we're going to get n is equal to 7. So that tells me if I use my Taylor series formula, I need to go up to and including the x to the seventh term. Okay, so this is where this gets a little bit tricky. So I'm using up to and including the x to the seventh term. Well, now when we look at that sine summation that we have, remember the x to the seventh term is going to correspond to n is equal to 3. So when we evaluate this and we say we want the sine of pi over 5, We're going to say it can be approximated by this. We're going to use the sum from n equals 0 to n is equal to 3. And it's going to be negative 1 to the n. Instead of x, I'm going to have pi over 5 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Now, if I've done this correctly, then what I should be looking at is up to and including the seventh degree term. So if I were to evaluate this series up to the n equals 3 term, I'm going to get pi over 5 minus pi over 5 cubed over 3 factorial plus pi over 5 to the fifth. over 5 factorial minus pi over 5 to the 7th over 7 factorial. Okay, so I've gone I'm up to and including the 7th degree term. And so that tells me then in the end, this value that I'm approximating sine of 5 to be is about 0.58779. Okay, so that's my approximation for the sine of pi over 5. So you can see we got pretty good accuracy. We only had to use really four terms in our series. And that's really where the power of these series comes into play is you start to see that you really don't need a lot of terms to evaluate this. Now, if you notice here, sine is actually an alternating series, right? Most of the time, if I have an alternating series, I'm actually not going to use a Lagrange error bound. I usually only use a Lagrange error bound when I have a series that is not alternating because it's so much easier to use an alternating series error.
So I want you to make note of what we did. Notice how many terms we ended up using. We went up to and including the x to the seventh term. Um, but we're going to do the same problem now, remembering how to do this with an alternating um, series error. So remember with alternating series error, we're just going to look at the size of the next term in the series, and that gives us our error bound. Okay, so let's take a look at how we would do this if we were going to use an alternating series um, error bound. So all I have to do when I use this setup is I have to look at, okay, first of all, I know the sine series again. The next term in the series would be pi over 5 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And I need that to be less than 0 0.000005. Now notice this time what I plugged in here, this is the actual term in the series. So when I did the Lagrange error bound, I'm thinking back to the Taylor series formula. When I do an alternating series error, I'm using the actual rule that I have for the series. Okay, so now if you plug into um, the calculator here and look at your table, you would find that that happens when n is equal to 4. So n equals 4 is my error term. So what that tells me using an alternating series is that if I want to get the sine of pi over 5 to 5 decimal place accuracy, that can be approximated by the series going from n equals 0 to 3, and I'd have negative 1 to the n, pi over 5 to the 2n plus 1, over 2n plus 1 factorial. And obviously, that's exactly what we had for the last problem when we used the Lagrange error. We just got there in a little bit different way. But in the end, we get the exact same result, 0.58779. Okay, so same result, two different methods. The main idea here is if I have a Lagrange error bound, I'm always referring to the term in the Taylor series with that n value, right? So that's referring to the general term in the series. When I look at an alternating series and I am evaluating, this n is referring to the term that is actually in my series once I've simplified it all out. I'm not like thinking about the Taylor series formula anymore. I'm thinking about my actual series rule. So a little bit different setup there from the perspective of, you know, what is everything going to represent? And really, it's this one I should have underlined. That's the one that we're looking at um, for the alternating series error. Okay, so um, that's the main idea with the error calculations. And you're going to practice a little bit with those in this section. We're going to go through some practice problems here, but that's a lot of what your homework is going to be. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. It says, approximate the sum of this series with an error less than 0 0.001. Okay, so first thing I want you to do is think about what type of a series is that? Should we use Maclaurin series error, or excuse me, should we use Lagrange error bound, or should we use an alternating series error? Okay, so hopefully you're seeing that it's an alternating series error. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video, figure out what the sum is, figure out how many terms you need, and then find the sum, and then find the decimal approximation um, based on what they're asking for here. Okay, so here is my solution. So like it says, since it's an alternating series error, we want 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial to be less than 0 0.001. And so what I did, rather than writing it as 2n plus 1 um, factorial in the denominator, I just took the reciprocal on both sides, which flips the inequality. And I said, where is 2n plus 1 factorial greater than 1,000? That happens when n is equal to 3. So that tells me I need to go up to and including the n equals 2 term, because the n equals 3 term is my error term, right? So then I got um, 0.842 by plugging into that series and using n equals 0, n equals 1, and n is equal to 2. And I just evaluated that on the calculator. Okay, so again, a little bit tricky because it depends on which error calculation you're doing. If it's alternating, the n is referring to the error term. If it's the Lagrange error, the n is going to refer to what's the degree that you need to stop at. All right, so I've got another example down here that's a little more involved that I want you to try. 
there's actually two parts to this. And this is a lot of what um, many of the AP free response questions will look like on this type of topic. It says, let f be the function given by f of x is cosine 2x plus pi over 6. So let p of x be the third degree Taylor polynomial for the function about x equals 0. Remember when it says a third degree Taylor polynomial, that means up to and including the x cubed term. So first thing they want you to do is find that third degree Taylor polynomial. That's p of x. And then on part b, they want you to use the Lagrange error bound. So when you see an expression written like this, where they have the difference between your function and your polynomial, that's telling me how far off I can be. The difference between my function evaluated at one tenth and my polynomial approximation for that function evaluated at one tenth needs to be less than one over 12,000. So I'm trying to show that the error is going to be less than 1 over 12,000 by using my Lagrange error bound. And they actually give you a formula for it here. So I want you to take a couple of minutes. I want you to write the polynomial. You can't use the known series for cosine here because we've done um, a horizontal shift. So when you start shifting away from your center point, it's really difficult to use the known series. So you're going to have to take the derivatives, evaluate um, the function and the derivatives at your center point, build your polynomial, and then from that you can do part B. So take a few minutes and work through that. Pause the video. When you come back, I'll show you the solution. All right, so here's what you should have ended up with on this one. And you can see that um, on this first part, I went through and I took all of my derivatives here. I just went to the x cubed term because they asked for a third degree Taylor polynomial. I'm not looking for a pattern to this. I just want to go up to and including the x cubed term. So that's all that really matters. And then um, that was pretty straightforward from there. The main thing is don't forget your chain rule when you go through this process. But you can see I've got a polynomial here. And again, I'm not asked for a general term, so I don't have to figure out what the pattern is. I just have to write all of the terms up to and including the x cubed term. Now on part b, use the Lagrange error bound to show essentially that my error is less than 1 over 12,000 when I evaluate at 1 tenth. So I'm looking at my fourth degree term. So I have to think about my fourth derivative here. My fourth derivative is going to have a coefficient of 16. That's all that really matters to me because I'm dealing with a cosine function. So I know the biggest, the cosine part of it is going to be 1. And I'm just going to assume my maximum value then is 16. So then I just plugged into the formula here. And when I evaluate this, I'm looking at the next term, right? We stopped at x cubed, so I need to go to the x to the fourth term. I said the maximum value was 16. So here in this notation, this is taking the place of m. So I plugged in 16 there. I plugged in 1 tenth minus 0 to the fourth power over 4 factorial. And I can see that that error is actually less than 1 over 15,000. So I know for sure my error is smaller than 1 over 12,000 because 1 over 15,000 is actually smaller than 1 over 12,000. Okay, so in the end, not that difficult to do. They actually gave us the Lagrange error bound formula. Most of the time, I wouldn't give you that and the problems won't give you that. Um, but in this particular case, they did. All right, so there's one more problem here I want you to try. And on this problem... Um, it's kind of the same idea. We're going to use alternating series error this time, but it says we're going to use the Taylor series for natural log of x expanded about x is 1. Okay, so what I'm hoping that you recognize is that's a series that we know. It says using that series, how many terms would be needed in the partial sum to compute natural log of 1.4 to 5 decimal places? Okay, so I want you to try this one on your own, but use the known series. Don't create the series this time. Go back to that first page in these notes and you see that series. So write that series out and then remember this is an alternating series so you can use alternating series error to evaluate. So pause the video. When you come back, I'll show you the solution. All right, so here's what you should have ended up with. Um, I know my series for natural log of x goes from 1 to infinity. It's negative 1 to the n minus 1 times x minus 1 to the n over n. And now for my alternating series error to figure out how many terms I need, I know if I added all the terms, I'd have the exact value for natural log of 1.4. Um, but we're not actually trying to get the exact value. We're trying to get accurate accuracy out to the four, five, fifth decimal place. So what I did was I said, okay, the size of each term is just going to be 4 to the n over n. 
And then I looked at um, using the calculator, when does 0.4 to the n over n become less than 0 0.00005? And that happened when n is 11. So remember, that means n equals 11 is my error term. So I have to use all the terms that came before that up to and including n is equal to 10. Now, it said, how many terms do I need to use? This can be a little tricky. This started at, at, at uh, n is 1, right? So I'm just going from 1 to 10. Clearly, that's 10 terms. Sometimes, though, your series will start at 0, and you have to account for that term when you're counting up the terms. So don't forget about that. In this case, pretty straightforward. But counting the terms can be a little tricky. Remember, n equals 11 was the error term. I want to go up to n is equal to 10, and that gave me 10 terms in this case. Okay, so um, you do have an assignment in Wiley Plus for this, but again, I included um, a worksheet for you. This worksheet that I included for you actually has some old AP free response questions. So I've typed them up, but these are actual AP free response questions because the way the questions are worded in the book sometimes is a little different than the way you'd see them on the AP exam. So in the book, do that first, do your Wiley Plus, but if you feel like you want to get some more practice and you want to get a feel for what these will look like, um, on an AP exam, that's what this worksheet is for. You don't have to turn this in, but it's good practice. It'll help prepare you for your test. It'll also help prepare you for your AP exam um, in another you know, month and a half or so.